particular. Uh, if you have been paying attention to the news, which if you haven't, I can't say I blame you. I know that you all are working toward uh, hopefully ending the school year uh, is as successfully as you possibly can. Um, the governor did sign House File 813 yesterday, and that is the charter school expansion uh, legislation. Um, this bill uh, enables um, outside entities, frankly, uh, that are not affiliated with local school districts uh, to create charter schools. They apply directly to the Department of Education uh, for uh, their successful application. Um, and they don't have to go through um, any sort of local accountability like we do traditionally um, uh, or as we do in the status quo with our charter school legislation. We have charter schools now, but they are affiliated with their local school districts and they are held accountable by their local school districts and their locally elected school boards. Um, that is not going to be the case now. Uh, and I will say that there were a few fixes uh, that were eventually passed in a piece of legislation that passed last night and was actually signed by the governor, House File 847, which I will talk about a little bit later. Um, but we still have significant challenges with this legislation and we will be diligently watching to make sure that if anyone tries to take advantage of the system in a fashion that is not good for students, um, uh, that we bring it to folks' attention. Um, we know uh, from speaking with our affiliates and colleagues across this, the, the, the nation that in other places where similar laws have been passed, um, there are nefarious actors for profit entities that come in to states, offer education management uh, skills, and at the end of the day, take with them state dollars, taxpayer dollars meant for per pupil funding for our education system um, and, and try to deliver a service as inexpensively as possible so that they can make a profit. That had not been something that was able to happen in this state before um, through the public school system, with the exception, <laughs> arguably, of a couple of virtual academies that popped up in 2012. But this is now going to open up an opportunity for, for different companies and organizations to come in and try to do that. And so um, it's unfortunate, but this conversation really was a part of a theme, frankly, that um, we saw throughout the entire legislative session, and that is parent choice, student choice. And it did not matter, quite frankly, how many facts uh, we provided in this conversation, how we shared the way that we already currently subsidize, uh, subsidize opportunities for folks to be educated outside of our public school districts. Um, things that we do, by the way, to ensure that that non-public school education they're receiving is as quality as it possibly can be, whether it's providing special education services to non-public school students, transportation services, textbook services, right? Or making sure, frankly, that we provide um, homeschool assistance programming, those kinds of things. This, however, um, takes it to a whole different level uh, and I'm afraid um, is gonna cause a lot of confusion um, and was done in such a rushed fashion that appropriate uh, backstops were not put in place. We don't know what happens if one of these charter schools um, is deemed to be um, appropriate and receives a contract from the state of Iowa uh, under the guidance of the Department of Education and the State Board of Education, and then shuts down inexplicably. Um, the students, by the way, will just frankly, have to go back and filter into our public school districts. We don't know how much it's going to cost the Department of Education, for example, to provide the funding level for any students that were not previously enrolled in public school districts here in the state of Iowa. Unanswered question that unfortunately was not addressed through this process. Um, and one other thing that I just want to make sure is on folks' radar, because this is something that I'm afraid is going to potentially be used to expand beyond um, the charter school expansion bill, and that would be uh, the creation of a new certificate of recognition for administrators at charter schools. So one of the fixes that was included um, in uh, last minute action uh, last night in a bill that passed and was signed by the governor uh, at approximately midnight, um, Ask that an administrator of a charter school, just like in a public school, um, be licensed under Chapter 272 or receive a certificate of recognition yet to be developed by the Board of Educational Examiners permitting them to be an administrator of a charter school. Well, I'm afraid that this is a slippery slope um, and that whatever the certificate of recognition that is developed by the Board of Educational Examiners would allow someone who does not have appropriate education or pedagogy in their background 
um, that we would expect traditionally of a leader of a school or a school district um, to now be in charge of a charter school. And uh, I'm afraid that we could see that uh, slippery erosion of standards um, actually bleed into our public schools. And so that's something we're going to be obviously keeping a watchful eye um, over. Um, other legislation that was passed that was frankly quite challenging. Um, if you have been paying attention to your hotlines uh, that are traditionally delivered every Thursday during the legislative session, you know that there was an amendment uh, that was offered uh, and attached to the Education Appropriations Bill um, that dealt with frankly micromanaging the accreditation process, um, incorporating into it uh, penalties that otherwise had not been previously enforced if there are accreditation issues tying House File 744, which is a free speech protection bill, and House File 802, previously known as the Divisive Concepts Bill, um, to accreditation. So if you were found to not be following the rules of those two laws, it could jeopardize your accreditation and therefore also jeopardize your state and federal funds uh, that a school district receives. Um, very unfortunate legislation, legislation that was added as an amendment without any sort of public discussion. It was a 10 page amendment. It did not receive any subcommittee or committee uh, discussion, no opportunity for the public to weigh in. Uh, it was moved late at night. Uh, and unfortunately uh, that amendment also includes um, a, a new opportunity uh, for quote unquote, public input on just about anything that a school district might be doing. Um, there is now a provision that would enable 10% of the eligible electorate within a school district or 500 people, whichever number is less, to petition for a public hearing on just about any issue of interest. If that issue happens to be curriculum, the school district is supposed to halt the usage of those materials in that curriculum um, for a period of 30 days or until the public hearing is held, uh, whichever is less, uh, and then make sure that they implement the appropriate uh, resolution. Um, however, the board uh, ends up making a decision based off the, the public hearing. So those 500 individuals or less are able to petition for this public hearing and call upon the school board to address their concerns. Now, we generally don't have any sort of issue um, with any sort of a public hearing scenario. We want to make sure that we remain connected with our communities. Um, but this, unfortunately, I believe is an overreaction um, and a continued infringement upon local control. And because there have been a number of divisive issues that have popped up this legislative session, there is a perspective by some legislators um, that school districts are doing things that are outside of their bounds or doing things that they don't believe um, uh, they ought to be doing uh, in different areas of education. The number of times this legislative session, I had to listen to a legislator talk about how public schools are not supposed to indoctrinate children um, can only be described as disgusting and disappointing because that has not been my experience. I do not believe that that is what our members and what our education professionals and our staff are doing in our classrooms. I think that exactly one of the things that public school is supposed to do is to help enhance the critical thinking skills of our students, right? And our staff for that matter through different professional development opportunities. And unfortunately, some of the legislation that was deliberately passed this legislative session, I believe is attempting to stifle those conversations um, to stymie that critical thinking uh, that we try to you know, encourage uh, and develop uh, within our students in our public schools. And we are just going to frankly have to be uh, smarter and figure out different ways to deal uh, with those situations. And thankfully we do have, we have some different ideas on how we can do that. But um, in terms of some of the other things that passed in the middle of the night or, or here in the last few days, um, uh, Morgan is gonna share with you uh, some election related changes that were made. Um, but I think it's really important that we kind of, um, for lack of a better way to describe it, discuss the elephant in the room. Uh, and that would be um, the majority party's desire to usurp local control, for lack of a better way to put it. Whether we are talking about the 100% required instruction return, uh, you know, in-person instruction requirement that was passed uh, by the governor back in February, or we are talking about um, different attempts that we saw in legislation to get rid of, for example, any sort of curriculum related to the 1619 project or any similarly developed curriculum. Um, 
or we're talking about getting rid of the voluntary diversity plans uh, in the five districts that had them before House File 228 was passed and signed very quickly by the governor, um, or most recently, um, the prohibition of school districts, cities, and counties to be able to implement a mask mandate based off of CDC guidelines. Um, all of those things are really, really unfortunate, but at the end of the day, um, they come down to state government's attempt to move away from issues related to local control. And we as an organization feel very, very strongly that we need to start, not start, we need to continue building relationships with our community members, both within our public school systems and also without um, or outside uh, of the public school system so that we can foster those different relationships. So frankly, we can respond and push back. We know our parents, our education professionals, our students and our community know, uh, members know our kids best and what is best to be delivering um, at our school districts and how best to meet the needs, educational and otherwise, of the kids that are in our classroom. And that right now is under attack. It's under the attack of um, a handful of folks who just happen to be very, very vocal, um, who frankly, are forcing some districts to make some really, really uh, challenging decisions and putting them between a rock and a hard place where they either comply with things that would be best for the safe and healthy uh, health and safety of both their students and the staff or put them in a situation where they're violating state law. Um, and that is the case with uh, what happened last night with House File 847. That bill, um, I will say, did not start out uh, as something that was going to lead to a prohibition um, of mask mandates within political subdivisions or local government. It actually has a couple of good things in it. It's got a couple of challenging things in it, too. Um, but included in that legislation uh, is also a doubling of the federal deductibility of uh, uh, teachers' Um, supply expenses. Uh, it previously had been 250 and now goes to $500 uh, just from a deductibility perspective. There is the required distribution of unspent TSS balances, for example, the creation of flexibility accounts, frankly, to give more local control to school districts to best meet their needs. Um, and then there are some really not good things in it. As another example, taking away additional local control, they're changing open enrollment policies, changing athletic uh, eligibility policies uh, related to those open enrollment issues, um, doing a whole host of things that are going to create uh, some problems, um, some real challenges, and that includes um, prohibiting school districts from doing what they think is best, again, to meet the health and safety needs of their students and uh, their staff. And I have never so quickly uh, seen a piece of legislation um, literally walked into the governor's office and signed um, at approximately midnight, um, putting that mask prohibition uh, into place uh, immediately. And whether your district has had a mask mandate or has not had a mask mandate, I think it's more important for us, especially as knocking on wood, we are hopefully emerging from the worst of the pandemic. Um, but the larger issue is this attack on local control and taking away the opportunity for local communities to make their decisions. And I appreciate how confusing that must seem when I just told you that the same majority party created a charter school expansion bill with no local accountability, right? So it, it's just, the hypocrisy is real. The challenges are real. Um, and I will say it has been... Um, it has been challenging to try to build relationships with people to take actions that are very common sense and in some situations to have some successes uh, and then at the same time feel like we're taking 17 steps backwards when some of these last minute actions were taken. Um, and, and those actions were being taken without appropriate public input. That amendment was dropped shortly before the House actually started debating last night. Um, and again, didn't have an opportunity for any public vetting or any public review. And so it has been, it has been challenging um, to say the least, but we have received, um, you know, some, some good work. We were able to stop some bad things um, and uh, push for some good things. But I got to tell you, if it had not been from the advocacy of this organization, uh, of the members, the people that are watching this webinar right now, it could have been much worse. We did not see any modifications to our public employee retirement system, right? No changes to IPERS. Um, we did not, uh, again, experience anything related to the vouchers um, or see that be successful uh, and come to fruition. And so 
um, it is because of your support uh, that we are able um, to, to share with you some of the good things that took place. Uh, and unfortunately, I have to share with you some of the other challenges that we've experienced this legislative session. We do, however, live to fight another day. Uh, and I would strongly encourage folks to continue um, to work on staying in tune with their local elected officials. And also really, really, um, I think taking into consideration the fact that it is gonna be an uphill battle for the next several years to frankly change the tide at the state house. It really is gonna be um, an uphill battle. And I think to that end, seeing what the priorities of the majority party are, um, and again, there have been some areas that we we are able to do th some good work in a bipartisan fashion. But at the end of the day, uh, it was partisan politics that pushed a lot of this across the line. I think we need to make sure we are making sure that we are building and fostering those relationships with our communities um, and addressing it at that level first and using that to influence the state house conversation. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over uh, to my colleague, Morgan Miller, who's going to tell us a little bit more. Thanks, Molly.